Welcome to the Starting Over Stronger Show, where you'll find help and hope for your divorce survival and recovery. Divorce well, live well. Life is hectic and stressful. Even before a global pandemic and socio-political and economic crisis, like most of us have never seen in our entire lives, that has taken over our lives the last two to three years, it was hard to find balance in our relationships and between our work and home lives to be effective in every area of our lives. There's just so much to do. When you add the struggles of separation or divorce and rebuilding your life after that, it can be unbearable at times. So what do you do during those times to maintain your composure or to be sure that you're responding the way that you want to in any given situation and to keep your hope and positive vibes flowing? Well, I think, unfortunately, we all have to admit that sometimes we just don't do that. We don't bite our tongue. We don't maintain our composure. And sometimes we don't respond the way that we wish we would have. Sometimes we don't even have a plan and the waves of emotion come on like that of the ocean. And and it almost feels like it's going to destroy our hope and the positive vibes do cease to flow. It's like it comes out of nowhere sometimes, this overwhelmed and out of control feeling that there's just too much going on and there's just too much wrong in the world and in our world and there's nothing we can do to fix it. The victim mentality is pervasive and insidious And if that's something you struggle with, I hope that you will go back in the queue on this podcast and find the episode that I did recently on the victim mentality. There's a lot of tips there, but regardless of no matter how much you know about it, it's hard to overcome with all these obstacles around us. And sometimes there's a little bit of consolation and other times There's not just knowing that so many people are going through the exact same things. And so today I wanted to talk about practicing the pause. Maybe you've heard this catchy little saying. It's become a famous life quote and it's credited to Lori Deshane, an American author and founder of the Tiny Buddha self-help website. It simply means that you're going to learn the skill of taking a break, stopping, or ceasing to speak or to act when you hit a state of despair or overwhelm that would otherwise lead you into regretful words or actions. So when we practice the pause, we're simply making room for more respect in our relationships. That goes for respecting yourself as well as respecting others. And it actually even allows others to respect you more too. This choice to pause has a ripple effect in our workplace, in our homes, in our marriages, because being slow to speak and slow to act is generally seen as more intelligent and more confident. It can also make it easier to enjoy your day-to-day life. And who doesn't need that? DeShane's full quote on this topic is, practice the pause. Pause before judging. Pause before assuming. Pause before accusing. Pause whenever you're about to react harshly. And by doing so, you'll avoid doing and saying things you will later regret. Practicing the pause means to deliberately stop whatever you're doing and just take a beat on that feeling that has you about to go over the edge. Because the truth is, most of our mistakes come from a place of overwhelm. And I believe God gave us emotions for a reason, but that reason was not for decision making or sometimes not even for conversing, (laughs) depending on how intense the emotions are. But our emotions are like the dashboard on our car. 
They let us know how we're performing, where a breakdown might be about to happen, when we are running on empty, how far we've gone, and what direction we are going. But these emotions are not good indicators for good decision making. So you might be angry, frustrated. It could be something very out there, but it also could be something like depression or just a general feeling of hopelessness or confusion. And so it can be quiet and insidious or covert. But the thing is that practicing the pause is just respecting yourself and others around you enough to temporarily halt your words and actions so that you can take more intelligent actions that are based on logic rather than emotion so that you're not making emotional decisions that you will later regret. That's really what we're talking about often here on the show when it comes to divorce because most people go through divorce on a very emotional level. And that's why so many mistakes are made. And so we're not just talking about calling your boss a jerk. You know, it's bigger things. It's more about, it's about more than refusing to engage in an argument with your soon to be ex. It's just coming from a very empowering place of being aware of when you have hit a limit and then being willing to take a step back and reflect on what's going on, what was said or done, how do I really want to respond to this, is this really the direction that I want to go, and then, you know, you can actually move forward with more confidence and clarity. Sometimes practicing the pause is a very small change in the middle of a busy day, and other times it's a very big pause in the middle of a major life transition. And so what I want to talk to you about today is about practicing the pause because it is simple, but it's also very powerful and it will make you feel better when you're feeling overwhelmed. We all need more mindfulness in our lives, more quiet, more reflection and more solitude and silence. So what I want to offer you today are several ways that you can apply the art of practicing the pause. And the first one is one I'm sure you've heard of before, and that is that when your temper is about to fly off the handle, you want to just stop and count to 10. You know, we all lose our temper, but it is a really sucky feeling, both during and after. And if, you know, we would take the time, whether it's counting to 10 seconds, 10 minutes, or 10 hours, If we just take some time, we can make it a little bit less regretful, you know, and that is just a fact of life. We we almost always say or do something we will regret when we give in to that feeling that we have in the moment of a temper flare. So why not give yourself some time? Um, Just think about what just happened. Create some space, whether that's going into another room for a while, or maybe it's telling somebody you're going to call them back later if you're on the phone. Maybe it's taking a walk, literally, because getting out and moving your body is actually going to help your mind to work a little more clearly as well. You know, when you really want to tell somebody off is the most important time not to. (laughs) And so this actually is in your relationships, of course, but it also includes when you're on social media. If you disagree with something, it's advisable to just keep scrolling and never come back to it. Or if you do come back to it, do it later when you have had some time to think about a way to write something compelling that's not caustic. You're rarely going to change an anonymous stranger's mind about anything, probably not even a friend. So you need to ask yourself if this response is necessary, if it's an important topic that you feel really compelled is necessary. Maybe just write your own new post on your own page in a respectful tone um, rather than as a counterpoint in the comments. And that might be more compelling to those who read it anyway. So just think about these things when you're on social media and when you're in conversations, when you feel 
anger, that is not the time to act. So count to 10. Are you tired of feeling alone and stuck in your current situation? Whether you're in an unfulfilling or toxic marriage, in the middle of a messy divorce, or maybe still seeking a better life after your divorce, Starting Over Stronger has a support group for you. You'll meet weekly online with a group of women experiencing all the same pain, fears, doubts, and confusion. And you'll leave there each week feeling heard, known, and cared for. You will come to understand why you are where you are and how to move toward happiness and fulfillment, feeling supported. Don't put it off another day. Go to startingoverstronger.com now and click groups in the menu bar. Get registered. And for just $88 a month, you'll start this week being a part of an amazing group of women whose presence presence and affirmation will help you feel less alone and stuck and more clear and confident come what may. And number two is to listen more than you speak. And when you're in a disagreement, obviously, one of the most compelling times, uh, you are really trying to just get your point heard most often. And there's, you know, a lot of reasons for that. But what you want to try to do instead is to try to understand the other person before sharing your own opinion and thoughts. People react better when they feel heard and when they don't feel challenged. So if you're having a conversation with somebody, the more you listen, the better you will be able to communicate your thoughts and feelings to them when it is your turn, because you'll be able to affirm what they're saying to you, to let them know that you hear them, and maybe even needing to say to them, you know, what I think and feel is different, but I honor you and the fact that you feel the way that you do. And bonus, it, the more you do that, the more people will do that for you. So listen more than you speak in conversations. And number three, the power of silence. Whether you are speaking in front of a crowd or you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a friend, maybe giving a presentation at work, do not underestimate the power of silence. Be purposeful about pausing in between sentences for effect. If you practice the pause when someone asks you a question, you give respect to that person. Your silence is basically letting them know that you're being thoughtful about your answer to them. You're not just saying something so fast that they are wondering whether you were even listening to them to begin with because you had such a quick comeback. If someone says something unkind, you will actually be giving yourself time to think of a good rebuttal. But you really can respond more confidently if you give yourself a little bit of time for your brain to digest what you just heard. So when someone says something to you, just pause and think about what they said before you decide exactly how you want to respond to it. And if others are listening to you, a purposeful pause can actually allow what you just said to really sink in. See how that works? <laughs> okay, number four. Take your foot off the verbal accelerator. The faster you speak, the more negatively you are perceived by those who hear you. Think about that for a minute. You probably know someone who talks so fast and never stops talking. And you probably have a little bit of a negative perception about that, right? But when you speak slowly, people can better absorb your words. And you will actually appear more confident in these situations, whether that's with family or if it's a speech that you're giving or if you're hosting a podcast <laughs> or live radio, a first date, a job interview, no matter what it is. If you want people to respond better in any given scenario, simply speak slower. Number five. 
pause when you get triggered. And here's the, the upside to this. You will literally be healing your brain. Your triggers, and we all have them, are your responsibility, not others. Your triggers are telling you where you still need healed. And your job is to identify what it is that's triggering you, why it's triggering you, and then to address it. That's your job. No one else's. So then you have to go to work to eliminate your triggers or do something else when they come up. But what you can't do is go around expecting other people to walk on eggshells because of your triggers. That's unfair and irresponsible. It's your job to figure out why you're being triggered and to work on figuring out how to heal that. And it's when you intentionally and purposefully work through the thoughts that you're having when you feel trig triggered, you're actually healing your own brain, which on the upside, you could cure the, or prevent the types of actions that you may have taken in the past when you were triggered from happening in the future. And we've all had that. We've all overreacted because we got triggered by something. But the, the truth is, that a trigger is just like another light on the dashboard that I talked about earlier with your emotions. It's trying to tell you something. And in the case of a trigger, it's oftentimes telling you what needs healed. And then you have the job of figuring out how to heal that so that you can prevent having those kinds of reactions in the future. Number six, practice the pause, is to pause before making impulse purchases. I don't know if you know this or not, but a lot of our shopping habits are emotional. I'm guilty of it too. But if you want to curb your budget, one good technique is to make yourself wait 24 hours before you hit buy now. If you still want the item 24 hours later, it is more likely to be a logical decision. In most cases, the emotion of wanting that unnecessary item will wear off in a 24 hour period and be replaced by a more logical thought of not really needing that thing or not being able to afford it or whatever the situation is. So if you're feeling like your budget is out of control, practicing the pause with your online shopping could be a very good thing. <laughs> Number seven, stop and smell the roses. You don't have to have a flower garden to know that the idea of this old saying is that you will handle all of life better when you move through life with more purpose and intention. And the more you do this, the less you may need to practice the pause due to overwhelmed emotions because there's a lot of mood enhancing power in resting and being more reflective about life. So however you smell the roses, whether that's taking a nice slow walk through your neighborhood or if that's literally stopping to smell some flowers or if it's playing with your puppy for 10 minutes in the morning before you go to work, whatever it is for you, just slowing down to move through your life with more purpose and intention will help you to reduce the emotional overwhelm that requires pausing. So keep that in mind. Number eight is a technique called the Pomodoro technique, and it's kind of a built-in pause for your workday. It's considered to be a work balancing tool, and it suggests that you focus on your work undistracted for 25 minutes and then take a five-minute break. That you do this every 30 minutes all day. That's the rotation, 25 minutes of work, five minute break, 25 minutes of work, five minute break. You can actually get a Pomodoro app on your phone to time it, or you can just use your phone's timer. The five minute pause lets your brain recover 
kind of like giving your phone battery a little juice every a couple of times every hour. And by doing so, your battery would not run out. They say you get more work done using this technique compared to working for several hours without a break. So try it and see what you think. Number nine, how about practicing the pause as you eat? Savoring every bite. Consciously eating slower would be one way to practice the pause so that you can enjoy one of life's more simple pleasures, food. I know I need this one because I love food. I won't deny it. I don't even feel like I'm eating fast, but I'm almost always the first one done. And probably because I tend to always have something else to do next, no matter what I'm doing. But how much would we benefit? Probably our digestion even would benefit from slowing down and savoring every bite as we eat. Number 10, one of my favorite kinds of pauses is the gratitude pause. Like we talked about last week, a lot of journaling benefit has to do with the giving of gratitude, being willing to take the time to sit down and write the things that went well that day, having gratitude and thankfulness for what's going right in life. So my Starting Over Stronger memoir is coming out in the next couple of months, and it's based on how I used journaling to change my life. I love sharing how purposefully journaling your wants, your needs, your worries, along with ending every journal with gratitude. And some people practice gratitude by just writing three things they're thankful for in a small format, just bullet pointing them at the end of each day. However you do it, taking a gratitude pause will bring you great benefit. It is the pause that keeps on giving all day long. Your divorce is almost final. Now what? Do you want to make sense of the past so you don't repeat it? Maybe you're tired of feeling ashamed for what you've allowed in your life or the mistreatment you have tolerated in your marriage or for the fact that divorce is a part of your journey at all. Have you ever thought about making yourself a priority in your new life but immediately worried you were being selfish? Maybe you're ready to break free of all the emotional ties to your ex and the unfulfilling or toxic relationship patterns of the past. I invite you to experience all this and more at the November 6th to 11th Starting Over Stronger Retreat in the perfectly peaceful Cedar Crest Retreat Center in Pleasanton, Kansas. On your Starting Over Stronger Retreat, you'll receive the rest you so desperately need, the silence and solitude along with the tools that allow you to reflect reframe and reset after your divorce so you can shift away from self-defeating and limiting beliefs and behaviors. You will gain authenticity, confidence, clarity, and grace, having learned my favorite proven techniques for a calmer, more centered head and heart space. And you'll be surprised how easy this transition can be and how amazing it feels. So don't miss out. Being an intimately sized venue, this event will sell out. Find out more now at www.sosretreat.com. I'm looking forward to meeting you there and transforming with you. Number 11 is an equally important one nowadays, unplugging. It's, in my opinion, one of the most important pauses in today's day and age because we spend so much of our lives online, on our phones, and not giving our brain one single moment to pause and do nothing from the time we wake up until the time we are back in bed again at night. These devices, our computers, our phones, our tablets, you name it, are keeping us from being present to live in the moments of our lives with those that we love. So if you don't make the decision to practice the pause by consciously limiting your usage to certain hours or putting your phone or your laptop or tablet away at certain times of day or during meals or what have you, it just won't happen sadly. 
So whether it's set times during the day or maybe going on social media for going off of social media, that is, for a week, whatever it is, mindfully pausing your screen time has incredible health benefits and benefits to your relationship as well. You will definitely feel better. I hope you'll try that. Number 12 is meditation and solitude. Being in total silence and stillness is one of my favorite pauses. I find myself often retreating outdoors to just be alone for a moment, to breathe fresh air. And, you know, it's just, it's a meditative state. Even if you don't do meditation, you know, you don't have to sit in a yoga pose with your fingers delicately (laughs) poised on your knees to practice the art of separating yourself from your thoughts and your emotions. And that's really what meditation is. It's just silencing your mind. And so there are many ways to meditate. A popular method involves taking deep breaths and focusing on your body. Um, But the more that you meditate, the easier it will get to let go of the constant stream of thoughts and emotions, which are the contributing factors to the overwhelm that we feel in our day-to-day lives. And the more that you start to recognize when you need this silence or meditation, and you will actually even begin to crave it the more you do it. So I hope you'll join me in trying this more often because I will admit that I struggle with it, but I love it when I do it. I feel re-energized and replenished every single time, even if it's just for a few moments. So give that a try as well. And then, like I said, journaling, I I mentioned it in framework of gratitude because that in and of itself is a way to practice the pause, just being grateful. But the reason I think that we have these major emotional overreactions is because our emotions build up within us without ever being processed or resolved. So, you know, it's kind of like driving your car without ever changing the oil. Gunk accumulates. The daily grind of our lives is just one giant constant distraction from the stuff that really matters in our lives. The big questions like, am I living the way I want? Am I truly happy? Am I tired of my daily routine? Does this job take too much of a toll on my mental health? Am I truly doing what feels right for me? And these questions can be difficult and uncomfortable. And that's why most people will never stop to reflect on them. Which is too bad because without asking the questions of yourself... You will grow old without ever achieving what you really wanted to in your life. And the fact is, none of us are going to be laying on our deathbed wishing we had worked more or spent more time on our phones. We're going to want to know that we lived our lives to the fullest and that we accomplished what we desired most within ourselves to accomplish. And how are we going to do that if we don't thoughtfully reflect on what that is? And that's all journaling is. Journaling is so intimidating and off-putting to some people, but the truth is that journaling gives us the pause that we need to be able to ponder how things are going, what we might like to change. And those who work with a life coach face these big questions throughout their one-on-one sessions. But if you don't have a coach, you can look into it or you can just start journaling. You can do both. Going through life aimlessly or worse, going through a divorce without goals and support to achieve what it is that you need to achieve will yield regret. So with or without a coach, please make it your aim to ask yourself some of these big questions and record the answers in a journal and see what you learn about yourself through that process. Number 14 You need a vacation. (laughs) I bet you already knew that. I didn't need to tell you, right? (laughs) Burnout is for real. Look it up. Have you felt burnout? Overworked? 
under rewarded for your hard work, constantly feeling like you're not doing enough. It's so heavy and it's a big issue. It causes big problems in people's lives. And the fact is everyone occasionally needs an extended pause from the grind of their careers to avoid burnout. So give yourself one. Spend some quality time with yourself or your family or your pets and don't feel guilty. Don't sneak work in because it's on your mind. Make yourself completely unavailable to your colleagues and to your to-do list during your time away. This is just basic self-care. Everyone should be doing it. And if they're not, they're paying a price emotionally or physically. And in some way, their work performance and mental clarity is suffering. Did you know that many other countries have four or more weeks of paid vacation per year? America is the only country that thinks one to two weeks a year is enough rest. It's not. I actually read a book and the title of the book was Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. It was written by Alex Young Kim Peng. And it really helped me to understand the value of time away from work, not only for my own joy and peace and sense of well-being and well-roundedness, but also because it bolsters our creativity, and our ability to be more productive when we are at work. But, you know, even with that awareness, sometimes life situations complicate our work and home lives. I know for me a lot lately, I have kind of been in my feels. (laughs) We'll put it that way. Life has been anything but normal or usual. It's kind of almost like living in a dream state or some kind of an in-between. None of us are totally sure what's going on in the world anymore, and it all has a very fuzzy feeling to it. I personally have had many paths open up for me, so many at times that it has felt impossible to choose. But then on the flip side, I've also had many doors close on me or just refuse to open. So as fate would have it, long before I knew I would be feeling this way halfway through the year, my 2022 word of the year was surrender. And that's been on my mind a lot. It's easier some days than others. I think we all struggle at times with that lack of clarity and with just how much faith and peace it requires to accept life on its terms, not knowing where we are being guided to. On the good days, it can feel like jumping in the car for a spontaneous road trip when you decide where to go as you go and just know that it's going to work out how it's supposed to and it'll be fun regardless. If you haven't done that, you should. It's amazing. Ads are so annoying, aren't they? As a podcast listener myself, I know this to be true. However, as a podcaster, I also know they are necessary. It takes a lot of time and expense to put together a podcast that airs every week and comes to you at no cost. As a woman recovering from divorce myself, I know that you understand my time is valuable. And that's why after almost two years on the airwaves and over 100 episodes, I find it necessary to start advertising to make it possible to continue to bring you this quality content that I know you need and want each week. But you can skip the ads altogether. Want to know how? Go to patreon.com slash SOS divorce, and you'll be able to select from three Patreon fan club member tiers that range from just five to $10 a month. You'll never miss it. And you never have to hear another ad again. You can also get bonus content, early access to episodes and more. That's patreon.com slash SOS divorce. And Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E. E-O-N. Thank you for your support of me as I offer support to you. We are all in this together. But on the bad days, it's extremely confusing. And the more we try to grasp at it, the worse it feels. 
I guess I'm undergoing a season of transformation again, or still. Are you feeling this as well? If so, here is what I have decided. Take from it what you will. The circumstances of life right now are anything but normal. Life is a little bit unpredictable, would you agree? And I think the best takeaway for any of us who are feeling this is to accept it, to empty ourselves in surrender to what will be while we just cling to who we are. We can create space for something new to emerge in this way. We just have to stop relying on what we think we know. I know sometimes we're afraid of surrender because we don't want to lose control. But the fact is, we never had control. All we've ever had when we thought we were controlling something was anxiety. So when you're confused and unsure, that is the perfect invitation to practice the pause. It's like part of me is being erased as if God holds the pencil and I'm his drawing and new parts of me are being colored in that I'm watching take shape slowly. And it strangely is incredibly frustrating. (laughs) Like I want to grab the pencil and do it myself, but only if we're struggling to surrender, right? If we let him hold the pencil, it probably wouldn't be near as frustrating. So let's instead view this time as a rare opportunity to live outside of what's normal, whatever normal is. I haven't known what normal is for years now. Maybe this is our chance to suspend our need for certainty or practicality. Right now, I'm going to speak for me when I share this next announcement with you. Today, I have decided to follow the advice of a little meme that came my way recently, authored by Joshua Becker. Whoever you are, Joshua, thank you for reminding me. So the quote is this, stop the glorification of busy. Busy in and of itself is not a badge of honor. It is okay to not be busy. Repeat this with me. It is okay to not be busy. In my personal efforts to surrender and stop the glorification of being busy, I have made the difficult decision of practicing the pause with the Starting Over Stronger podcast. It's become increasingly challenging over the last six months, both to find new and original content and to bring it to you in a cost-effective way. I've always had big goals and big visions for this podcast, and I am proud of what we have accomplished in 111 episodes over the last two years. And I don't think we're done, but I have hit a place where I feel that I need to create some space to see what might evolve. My career has been evolving for over four years, and in some ways is still not where I thought it would be this far in, but so many amazing things have transpired that it's really almost kind of hard to concentrate on anything. Like I said earlier, so many paths have opened up and I can't do it all. And I have definitely glorified being busy, all with the intention of fulfilling my purpose and helping people make difficult life transitions well. And so now I have decided is a time for focusing in on fewer things. And as part of that decision, I've decided that I need to pause the podcast. I do not yet know for how long. The good news is that unless you have already listened to all 111 episodes as of today, you have dozens and dozens of hours of content yet to consume. And if you have listened to them all, you can probably go back and re-listen to some that you loved or didn't yet need at the time they came along. So just go back through the catalog all the way back to August of 2020 to episode one and enjoy anything and everything you can from what we've put together for you this last couple of years. And as I take this step back for a while, practicing what I preach, practicing the pause, I'm asking you to join me and stop and think about what you might need to pause right now. 
practicing the pause in these big ways is about recognizing what is not flowing and not forcing things to happen. In the long run, my hope is that this season of pause helps me focus less on the temporal and material world and and always striving to grasp and to focus more on that strong sense that I'm a part of something bigger, something spiritual. And from this space, I hope that I can open up and embrace what comes to discover what that is exactly. This seems to be a time for me anyway, and I hope maybe for you also, to find freedom from what's known. Out of this experience, I hope that greater clarity can come that will allow me to embrace my whole self, to know exactly what direction my career is going and where my skills and abilities are best suited. And my prayer is that you can do the same in whatever your life calls you to, whatever in your life requires a pause. Please connect with me at startingoverstronger.com or join me on the Facebook Starting Over Stronger After Divorce group. Anytime you need private or group coaching or if you're ready for a post-divorce healing retreat, I'm going to be here serving your needs. That is my calling in this life. And until we meet again, let's just be. I'll be me. You be you. Let's be grateful for the love that we have from the friends and family who truly love and embrace us for who we are. And let's let all the other negative people and things go. Let's just be fully present in the moments and fully authentic with everything and everyone in our lives our work lives, and our personal lives. And when I am not okay, I have my tribe with whom I can just not be okay for a while. And you have that too. And if you don't, you can create it. Starting Over Stronger is all about being real. It's a longer process than we might want it to be sometimes, but there's always good. We just have to pause some things sometimes to find it. Meanwhile, give and receive lots of hugs. Embrace the tears when they come. They're there for a reason. Trust the process. And always, always, always remember that healing is not linear. It's not easy. But there is help and hope to be found wherever you are on your journey of starting over stronger.